For generations, Ventura has thrived on the dedication and determination of extraordinary individuals, cultures, and families that guided and inspired our community. Family members from these pioneering families celebrate their remarkable histories by sharing captivating stories and personal memories. These are Ventura Legacies. Joining us today for this edition of Ventura Legacies is Jeff Smith. And as you'll see, he covers a lot of families. Jeff, welcome. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join your show. It's a great honor to, to be here today. And I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about uh, uh, my family on my father's side, as well as uh, my family on my mother's side. As I said in my introduction, you cover more than just, there isn't just the Smith family, it's the Hobson family, it's the Pettit family. Correct. So where do you want to start? I think I'd start maybe at the, at the beginning in Ventura County, which would be the Hobson family. And I'd start with William Dewey Hobson, who was my great, great grandfather. He was born in 1829. And in 1849, at the age of 20, he took a wagon train to California. And I actually am uh, relying upon quarterlies that were uh, prepared by the Museum of Ventura County back in the day when it was called the Ventura County Historical Society. And actually, William Dewey Hobson is on the front of this particular one, although most of the contents here have very little to do with him. The wagon train group was so large that they decided to switch into two groups. And he was asked, William Dewey, or as we call them, WD, to lead one of those groups. And he was immediately promoted to captain. In those days, it didn't take much to <laughs> get these kinds of promotions. And so Captain uh, Hobson successfully led the uh, his group across the plains to Sacramento. The other group was not so lucky. They were, in fact, massacred by the Indians. Really? And according to the quarterly, in its own kind of convoluted language, uh, the reason was is because the other leader uh, didn't took the took an approach the opposite of Captain Hobson's, which was to treat the Indians in a friendly manner unless, of course, they attacked the wagon train. Whether any of that story is true, I don't know, but at least according to the quarterly, it is. He was an amazing uh, entrepreneur. He immediately went to the California gold fields. He built uh, sluice lines and had some investments in um, some mines, and within a couple of years was running a hotel called the Western Hotel in Sacramento. He then also decided that uh, he wanted to get into the cattle buying business and started traveling all over California and ended up in Ventura in 1854. He liked what he saw, and in 1859, he moved his family to Ventura. When he arrived in Ventura, this entrepreneur started another career. He became a builder, and he built the first brick building here in Ventura, the Cone Store. He built the first courthouse, the predecessor to the A.C. Martin courthouse that is now the city hall and is a beauty. Actually, the predecessor to W.D.'s uh, courthouse was the upstairs of a saloon. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether or not the, uh, the, the, the court personnel were happy or sadder <laughs> to move into, into a new courthouse. He also built a number of other buildings. One of them that you can still see is Pirano's Grocery Store on Main Street and many other homes. He did one of the schools, the Hill School, which is no longer there, but it's one of the first brick schools. He also dabbled in newspaper business and he was the editor for a short time of the Ventura Signal. Um, apparently he didn't really like that too much and his wife and he opened another hotel it's called the Occidental Hotel, which was on Santa Clara and California streets. He also decided to get into ranching and uh, purchased a number of ranches and also leased additional cattle ground. And he also opened a meatpacking plant. He was also involved in community affairs. He, for a short time, was the Justice of the Peace. He uh, also supported the uh, uh, efforts to move Ventura out of Santa Barbara County. When he moved there, it was located in Santa Barbara County, and the first um, effort was a failure. 
And so he was actually asked to lead a second effort. And in 1873, uh, he and his delegation were successful. And so Ventura County uh, became what it is today. And he is sometimes called the uh, father of Ventura County as a result of that. Wow. Like so many families, he had um, 10 children. And at least two of them uh, really are important to Ventura's history. Uh, his first child, his son, was Abram Lincoln Hobson, my great grandfather. Now, surprisingly, he was born in uh, 1861. He was named after uh, the president, incoming president of the United States. But unfortunately, they didn't know the correct spelling of the president's name. And so my great-grandfather is Abram, A-B-R-A-M, Lincoln Hobson. Interesting. That's great. A few years later, his son, William, was born, or as we always called him, Will. When Abe reached the age of uh, 16, he uh, started working in his father's meatpacking business. And his brother, Will, which is the reason I mentioned him before, um, then joined him in that meatpacking business. And the two of them, after a few years, bought the business from their father. They didn't inherit it. They did not inherit it. It was not a gift. They bought it. And at that point, it became known as Hobson Brothers Packing Company. Abe and Will then expanded that business dramatically to the point where it had as many as seven retail stores stretching from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara. And that packing business continued on until sometime in the mid-30s, and I don't know exactly when it ended. And was all the cattle from the, the, the area here? It was a totally vertically integrated enterprise. They raised the cattle, they had the feedlots, they had the slaughterhouse, uh, they had the meat packing plant, and the retail stores. Wow. Both Abe and Will uh, expanded the, the, the ranching. Abe actually uh, went off to Salt Lake City and built a gravity-fed sewer system for them there. Abe and Will, along with some partners, laid out uh, the city of Blythe, which is on the mm -hmm. uh, eastern edge of California, um, near the Colorado River, sure. and at least tried to promote it as a place for farmers and, and people to go. Um, and then Abram also um, uh, designed uh, and, and developed what's now called Hobson Heights, which is the wonderful area on the hillsides overlooking the city and the ocean. It's interesting because I, when people think of Ventura County, they think of agriculture, and I don't think they realize how much ranching was, a, was such a big part of the whole uh, development right. of the area. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So by this point, you're probably wondering why my name is Smith, since I'm talking about Hobson. <laughs> well, my, my grandfather, Fred W. Smith, married into the family. A wise he man. married, <laughs> yes. He married Grace, who was Abram Lincoln's daughter. He then started working in the family business, and when Abe died in, I think it was 1929, he then continued it. Fred probably loved the Lions Club more than, than actually managing the businesses, although he did a wonderful job of it. He was one of the early members, if not a founding member, of the Ventura Lions Club. Um, and he also uh, rose to the position of president of Lions International and traveled all over the wow. world visiting various Lions Clubs uh, and collecting all kinds of uh, souvenirs that I, I remember as a child seeing. So I do want to tell you one story just Please. about my, my grandfather, Fred, and I have this very distinct memory. It was back in the 1970s when you know, he told me, you know, Jeff, um, I've rented a shed back behind uh, the old meatpacking plant, and I've rented it to some hippie who makes mountain climbing gear. And he said, you know, I mean, he's really a very nice guy, but I don't know if this business is really going to take off. And of course, as I can tell from your smile, <laughs> you know exactly who I'm talking about. It, he did, in fact, rent it to Yvon Chouinard, who is the founder of Patagonia. He did okay. I think he, he did, did okay. not only okay, mm -hmm. he then ultimately bought the old packing plant, and it is now the uh, store. Oh. So the next time that you go to Patagonia to buy any of their wonderful products, 
you were walking in the middle of the old Hobson Brothers packing plant. Yeah, the, the yellow building? That's, that's, the, that's yellow the former building. the four packing. Yeah, Fab, yes. Fabulous. And there's actually a little plaque, I don't know who put it on, that, that will I'll reflect that. I'll check that out. So anyway, those are a few stories about the Smith side of the family. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to switch then to the Pettit side. Please. And again, my name is Jeffrey Pettit Smith. Okay. So the Pettit is obviously from my mom. And the Pettit family also has a deep connection to Ventura County. They basically arrived in the 1880s and settled on the Oxnard Plain. And the person who I really want to talk about today is my grandfather, who unlike William Dewey, I actually did know. And my grandfather, Charles W. Pettit, was the longest serving mayor of Ventura. Back then, they didn't have a rule where uh, city council members would select one of their own for two-year terms. There were no term limits. And so as a result, he served as mayor from 1953 to 1969, and then served on as honorary mayor until his death in 1973 at age 91. Wow. But in addition to his long career as a civil engineer and as a farmer and then as a politician, actually kind of late in life, um, he was a wonderful storyteller. And he dictated a family history, which again, I happen to have a copy of. Oh. It was actually dictated in 1951 so I'm not sure what the tapes were. I guess they were probably those old wire tapes in mm -hmm. those days. And this was just somebody many years later found the tapes and then just uh, transcribed them. As best as I can tell, there was no editing. Um, but he had just a wonderful way with words. And so to tell you a couple of these stories, yeah. I'd like to actually quote his language because it's better than anything I could probably come sure. up with. So anyway. The story of the Pettits begins with Jean-Baptiste Petit, better known in the United States as John B. Pettit, who was born in France in 1810. He and his family then moved uh, to the United States, to Pennsylvania, uh, I think in 1853. Uh, and he had five children. I'll tell you the names because they do pop up again. Uh, Frank, who was actually Charles W. Pettit's father, Henrietta, Annette, Margaret, and Justin. Jean-Baptiste Petit was an old school Frenchman. And uh, according to my grandfather, and this is a quote, he was not yet far enough removed from the Napoleonic Wars to have lost his abiding hatred for England and all things English. <laughs> and although he lived in America for 42 years, he refused to learn English. Really? And hmm. that was a real problem <laughs> because obviously there weren't a lot of people who could speak English. So one of the stories that my grandfather tells here um, that I haven't told before um, is a story about uh, J.B. Pettit who apparently when he arrived he had an option to purchase a thousand acres of land in Pennsylvania. And every year he would go to see the agent to try to exercise his option. But he spoke only French, and of course the agent only spoke English, and so no deal was ever done. So just on the final year when um, the option was about to run out, uh, JB asked his son Frank, which was Charles W.'s uh, father, uh, who was a young boy at the time, to accompany him and be the interpreter. Well, the young boy just didn't want to go on this trip, which I find kind of odd, because I would have thought he would have wanted to, but he didn't. And he refused to go. And so as a result, that option was lost. And it turned out that this option for something like a 1,000 acres was in prime Pennsylvania coal country. And so according to the family lore, according to my grandfather, you know, this was our, the, the family's big chance to become coal barons, and it, of course, never happened. But, so you'd be living in Pennsylvania, not in California. Oh, don't worry. We get to California. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just about to get there. Uh, basically, the family uh, had a lot of different ventures. They had, were, 
had sawmills and they tried uh, farming and actually they bounced around a little bit from Pennsylvania and a couple of other states. But ultimately the entire family moved um, to California. And the first one um, to be there uh, was a guy by the name of Martin J. Laurent, which I again think in English was probably Laurent, and so I'll call him Laurent from now on. And he had married one of uh, JB's daughters, Annette. And again, according to my uh, grandfather, um, Martin Laurent was a dashing young man with a red beard who worked as a purser on, a, on Mississippi river boats. So they arrived in Ventura, uh, or in Oxnard, in 1872. Um, and Justin Pettit, the youngest one, uh, arrived shortly thereafter, and Martin Laurent met him in El Rio. And said, well, you know, welcome, welcome to California. How much money do you have? <laughs> and uh, Justin said, well, I got 25 cents. Martin said, great, let's walk across the street here to Cohen's Saloon, have a few beers, and you can start from scratch. <laughs> and in fact, that's exactly what they did. Justin did start from scratch, and over the many years, I mean, he was very successful as, as a farmer. And indeed, as a side note, um, if you go to Heritage Square and look at some of the old houses, one of the houses is, a, is the McGrath Laurent house, and the other house is the Justin uh, Pettit house. Uh, the, the McGrath Laurent house now has a, um, an Italian restaurant in it. And uh, the Pettit house, uh, which can be visited in the uh, basement, was where uh, the Elite Theater was located for many years. They've just moved down to new quarters in the last couple of years. Frank Pettit, uh, Charles's um, father, he came to um, uh, Los Angeles in 1882, and then at that point in time, to get to Ventura County, you had to take a buckboard or a springboard, and it was a two-day journey just to get to the top of the Cuneo grade. And again, using my, my grandfather's language, I mean, the top of the Cuneo grade is a little different than it is today as to what it was then. It, it's not nice and green and and orchards and, and beautiful farmland and a few residents here and there. Back then it was dry and dusty, um, totally barren, maybe a, no, not a tree, uh, maybe uh, some herds of sheep. And of course, when the Santa Anas or the uh, uh, east winds blew, it were just giant dust balls that would just flow across the Oxnard Plain and into, and into the ocean. Uh, so it was a very different world, and the Pettits basically uh, uh, settled in, on the Oxnard plan, uh, Plain, and uh, Frank was one of those who, every time he had an extra nickel, he bought more land. He very cash poor, land rich. Um, and so the person I really want to talk about, Charles W. Pettit, grew up on a farm, and he talks, I mean, it's really amazing how hard that life was back then. And, and my grandfather really did a nice job of, of uh, describing uh, that life and that lifestyle. He went to a one-room school, the uh, Buena Vista School, uh, all grades from first through eighth grade, I think. Uh, he was in one of the early classes of the uh, Ventura High School. And basically on the urging of the superintendent of the high school, Frank was talked into allowing his son to go to UC Berkeley, where uh, Charles went to Berkeley. He studied engineering for a while, and then he actually went to uh, Cornell and studied more engineering. And then he bounced around for a few jobs, didn't like them, and lo and behold, he came back to Ventura County. And he got himself a job with the county surveyor's office. Um, and in 1915, uh, he ran for the job. It was an elected position, and he was elected. One of his first jobs was the Ventura Bridge at the end of Main Street. And it still stands there today. It basically was the final link to try to go from Ventura to Santa Barbara. 
as you probably know, there was a time when the way you got to Santa Barbara was to run your buggy at low tide along on the beach. And it was a major, major step first to build the ramparts for the, for the road. And then, of course, you had to build the bridge across the Ventura River. There are other roads that you can see today. Um, I think my favorite is Highway 150, the Casitas Pass Road, mm -hmm. uh, going from Ojai to uh, uh, Santa Barbara or Carpinteria. And you'll know it's been improved over the years, but you'll know the parts that my grandfather did because those are the twisty parts. <laughs> Similarly, if you take 150 going the other way from Ojai up to Santa Paula, you'll go over the Denison Gray, and that again was something that, that he designed. Wow. He also, and this is where it's almost amazing, he got to know my great-grandfather, Abram Lincoln Hobson, and worked for him. Did most of the engineering work for the city of Blythe, did the engineering work for Hobson Heights, and did a whole lot of other uh, of other things. So at some point, uh, his daughter, Janice Pettit, who's my mom, married my father, Rodney Smith. And so these two families that had actually known each other and were friends for years were finally joined in marriage. Charles really started his political career late in life. I mean, he was uh, 66 years old when he was elected to the Ventura City Council. And I want to quote the uh, Star Free Press about him. Uh, and this is what they said, I think this was in the obit of his. Mr. Pettit not only held the post of mayor longer than anyone else, but he was the most colorful, clever, and witty of the lot. Many are the persons who have felt the barb of a witty Mayor Pettit, who let them know in a polite but definite manner that they were out of order. He could settle an angry verbal battle among his council counterparts by intervening with a humorous observation, which would restore calm and leave the combatants feeling somewhat foolish for their part in the squabble. <laughs> wow. Quite a tribute. He, and I saw this in person, he, he truly loved his duties as a mayor. I think my favorite thing that I remember is he, uh, he had to be in his 80s, uh, participated in a soapbox derby race <laughs> with the mayor of Santa Barbara. <laughs> and I there, I watched him heading down uh, that road and he made it to the bottom. Um, the mayor of Santa Barbara beat him slightly. Um, but he danced the, uh, he danced the twist at the senior center. Um, he did all the proclamation signing and appearances that are part of a mayor's job. The other thing that I saw as, as, a, as a grandson is that his sense of humor truly encompassed all of his life. At age 85, uh, Charles uh, said that uh, he would not run for office, but would stand for election. <laughs> and he won. And at that point, he was the oldest mayor in the United States. At age 90, he's quoted as saying, this birthday kind of snuck up on me. I consider this the most dangerous decade of my life. Many enter it, but few survive it. <laughs> and in 1973, at age 91, he died peacefully in his garden, setting a standard, I think, for all of us. Exactly, exactly. And, you, and obviously you knew him, so there was- I did, and I, I certainly, he was a very gentle, very witty man, and the kind of, the kind of, uh, a wit was, it wasn't nasty, it wasn't mean, it, but it was really funny and it, I could see how he did what we don't see too much in today's politics. Uh, he really did a very, very, he was really a wonderful person. The personal memories are the things that always touch people. Is there a favorite story about your grandfather as a boy? that comes to mind. Well, my favorite one actually is the Patagonia story. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great <laughs> to be story. Quite, to be quite honest. Um, you know, he was, he, uh, my, my grandfather was, was uh, a very interesting man. And one of the, actually probably my favorite thing about him uh, was when I turned 16, um, he gave me a Model A Ford pickup truck. And this was a pickup truck that had been sitting in a garage probably had been used back in the meatpacking business. 
and had really not been used for 20 or 30 years. And that kind of gave me a, a little bit of a hobby for the next few years as I, uh, not very well, but I did restore it and get it running, and uh, that was my first car. So I, I always thank him for that. That's terrific. Well, Jeff, thank you. Thank you for sharing this history. Thank you for sharing your family. I mean, it, you touch, as I said, you touch all areas of the community. And, um, and I do think it's an inspiration. It is, certainly is an inspiration to people. And I will follow your lead. We will tell a lot more of these stories. Because to me, it's about people. It's about the relationships that we have uh, in a community like this. And I know more and more people have heard about the Ventura Legacies Project and are really curious of where it's going to go. And you're right, it's opened more and more doors. So thank you. And thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll be telling more Ventura Legacy stories down the road. Please tune in. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay.